the funding and policy realm that we're definitely ready for this uh, last fifth final panel, which is going to explore how we go about increasing funding and strengthening public policy for environmental literacy. So I'm very happy that we have such a, a great uh, panel of very uh, well-seasoned experts in environmental education policy, uh, systems ecology and economics, and public health, uh, in particular the linkages between environmental and public health with a special focus on children. So our panelists, uh, we have Kevin Coyle with the National Wildlife Federation at the far, far end there, Samir Doshi with the Gund Institute for Ecological Economics, sitting next to him. Um, Jerome Paulson, who's an MD and is with the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment, and Jim Elder, who is with the Campaign for Environmental Literacy. Now, to maximize the time, which is only an hour, uh, that we have for real dialogue between both the panelists and you all in the audience, um, I'm going to ask our panelists to each spend only a few minutes, two to three minutes, um, to give you a little flavor of their respective backgrounds and the constituencies and communities with whom they work, and then offer maybe one, one thought that they have about the topic of this panel, which is about how do we go about increasing funding and strengthening public policy for environmental literacy. And then we'll, we'll start with some questions. So, um, Jim, would you like to begin? Uh, sure. Um, my name is Jim Elder. I'm a campaign for environmental literacy. Um, CEO was launched about uh, five years ago with the help of the National Wildlife Federation, Earth Day Network, um, American Association of Community Colleges, Second Nature, uh, a number of other groups, really to fill a gap that uh, we simply weren't, the field of environmental literacy wasn't at the table um, uh, at the federal level when uh, decisions were being made about appropriations and, and uh, education policy. Um, so I think I'll just leave it that. Good morning, I'm Jerry Paulson. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I spend a lot of my time uh, teaching um, medical students, pediatric residents, uh, students in the School of Public Health, and um, physicians about the impact of environmental issues on uh, human health. And um, if you all will um, indulge me um, in a little bit of dangerous behavior in a, a meeting, I'm going to ask you all to do something that I, I know, at least in this audience, you do all day, every day. Um, but I want you to close your eyes for 10 seconds and think about the environment. Okay, and before you all drift off into stage four sleep or something like that, um, open your eyes back up, and as you thought about the environment, whatever image came to your mind, how many of you saw people in that image? Okay, so probably less than one per table, in spite of the fact that this is group of people who are among the most environmentally oriented people um, in Washington, D.C. right now. I have a hypothesis that I don't know how to test, but my hypothesis is that if individuals in society recognize the connection between the state of the environment in which they live and their own health and the health of their families, they would be more inclined to do things to improve the state of the environment. And we can talk about place-based learning and all sorts of other things, but let's be frank. Um, one of the greatest um, self, one of the greatest motivators for people to change behavior is what does this mean to me and mine? And how is what I'm going to do going to improve my life and the life of the people that I love? And understanding the connection between the environment and their own health status or their, the status, health status of their loved ones, I would argue, 
would be a way um, to make a link and get people more motivated, more willing to fund um, environmental endeavors, more willing to have their politicians and leaders um, fund environmental endeavors. Thank you. Good morning. Um, yeah, I'd just like to echo that it's a privilege, definitely, to be here. Um, my work, uh, I also have a, started a new appointment at Queen's University in Ontario uh, in the Department of Mine Engineering, I'm a systems ecologist. Um, and my focus is really uh, working with communities and degraded landscapes. Uh, in, in places where there's not a lot of privilege, but uh, more poverty and uh, inaccessibility. And uh, currently, my work revolves around uh, Appalachia and Montauk Google mine landscapes in, in those regions and the communities that are affected by uh, these processes. Um, I uh, I want to read uh, just a couple of lines from an article that uh, sums up, I think really accurately of the voices that I try to work with that are not wholly represented um, in these, these discussions that we've been having. And it's an article by Orson Aguilar, um, who is a Latino from East Los Angeles. It's entitled, Why am I am not an environmentalist? For communities like mine, environmentalism is seen to be about preserving places most of us will never see. Even when environmentalism has focused on problems that affect urban communities, such as air pollution or lead poisoning, it has pointedly avoided addressing our desperate need for economic development. Environmentalists do not talk about the importance of a living wage or affordable housing. Because, we are told, those are not environmental problems. Foundations feed this problem by failing to recognize minorities and urban city residents as prominent stakeholders in the environmental arena. Remove the word environmental from the sentence and replace it with civil rights, women's rights, environmental justice, or social justice, and it makes just as much sense. For too long, progressives have created their identities according to the very specific problems we hope to solve. While I don't consider myself an environmentalist, I do care about many of the things that environmentalists work to protect and preserve. I care more deeply, however, about creating good jobs and affordable housing for my community. This means that the environmental or post-environmental movement that will speak to my community must first and foremost promise economic development and a better quality of life. Uh, I just want to leave you with one statistic, and I know everyone in here likes to tossing out numbers quite a bit. Um, something to me that's most powerful is that in 30 years in this country, in the States, that over 50% of this country will be people of color. And we consistently talk about how our ecosystems are evolving and the issues that are involved with that, but not how our culture is evolving. So these are going to be the leaders of our businesses, of our government, our classrooms, and our communities. And I'd like to challenge all of us in this room to see how we can incorporate those voices, those languages and cuisines and music and culture, dialogues, into these conversations. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Kevin Coyle. I'm the Vice President for Education and Training at the National Wildlife Federation. I don't know how much you know about the Wildlife Federation. Um, it's a national um, advocacy organization. We have four million members and supporters. We have uh, statewide affiliates in all of the states. And um, our commitment to uh, environmental education and conservation education is long standing. It started 50 years ago. Believe it or not, with Ranger Rick magazine, and um, we have a lot of uh, similar concerns to share here about how you reach um, various communities. And so, I won't throw out a lot of numbers to you, but I will ask you a question. In the last two years, two years, how many of you have uh, testified before Congress or state legislature or city council or county board? Be good. Active and involved group. How many of you have written letters or communicated with a with a legislator at some level? Very good. Very good. Um, 
the premise that I think we're going to be talking about today is not whether we can increase the funding base for what's roughly defined as environmental, uh, natural resource, ecological, science-based uh, education, um, but rather how we do it. And the reason I say that is that uh, right now in the U.S. Congress, there are a number of pieces of legislation which when you add up the dollar value of them, uh, sitting before us is somewhere in the neighborhood of $2 billion in opportunities, $2 billion in funding for the work that we all do. And we have to get better organized about how to access that, how to pursue that, how to support that, how to keep that coming. So we'll talk more about that during the course of this conversation. But what I'm going to suggest is that many of us when in the environmental education field grew up in the field somewhat disconnected from advocacy. We were educators. We were uh, people who um, had a certain level of integrity, purity. We didn't get political. We just worked on you know, the, the uh, educating uh, children or adults or whoever the audience might be um, and, and really securing them a certain discipline. And what I suggest here is that there's an opportunity for us to wear two hats and to always wear those two hats. One of them is as an educator, but the other is as an advocate. And an advocate in a very real way, uh, not just advocating for environmental literacy or ecological literacy or, or whatever that might be, but actually advocating um, with people who make decisions about how big the purse is for the work that we do. And I think that there, we'll talk about that a lot during this panel, but there's a lot of opportunity there. And getting access to that and having you folks participate more in that is going to be very valuable to the field. Thank you all for your introductory comments. And Kevin, your, your point about the, the need to really engage, that it really is all about engagement, of course, echoes what Will Allen was talking about yesterday. And I think is a nice segue to the first question I'd like to pose to all our panelists, which is, what opportunities or hurdles do you see for advancing environmental literacy when you look at the current political climate at the state and the federal level? Jim, you want to start? Sure. Um, to sharpen Kevin's context a little bit, uh, which, which was very helpful, um, about four years ago, the federal government was dedicating um, approximately $18 million a year uh, in funds specifically for environmental education, environmental literacy. Uh, it's now up to around 55 million in rough, term, rough uh, numbers. 10 of that uh, is, uh, 10 million of that goes to NASA for their climate change education program. 10 million goes to NSF for their climate change education program. About 20 million goes to NOAA for their two environmental education programs. About 10 million goes to EPA. And somewhere between three and five is, is being uh, distributed by the Department of Ed uh, through their new uh, University Sustainability Program. In those four years, um, we've managed to get one new program created, the one I just mentioned with the Department of Ed, and we have two bills that have been passed by the House, um, but not yet by the Senate, um, those being the Coastal Watershed and Ocean, uh, Ocean Education Act and the No Child Left Inside Act. So we've had a window of opportunities the last couple of years, and I think in terms of Congress, that window is, is starting to close, and we have to adjust our strategies accordingly. In terms of the administration, it remains open. Um, we have uh, a, a terrific set of leaders in uh, throughout the administration who are increasingly valuing education as a part of their agenda in moving towards the green economy. Uh, our Secretary of, of Commerce is interested in education. Um, our Secretary of Energy is interested we had the Secretary of Education actually stand up uh, about three weeks ago and say sustainability and environmental literacy is really important and we haven't done enough and we're promising to do more. So we can still work with the administration uh, in the coming couple of years and I think we need to really focus our attention on that. So with this change in political climate uh, that's probably going to happen in November and, and the change in economic climate that we've been suffering through for some time, how do we change our strategies? Uh, I would suggest that there are three changes we need to make. One is that we've got to start thinking a little bit more about infusing our agenda into uh, 
um, existing programs and existing bills. Um, the American Competes Act, which is a large STEM education funding uh, program, uh, when, it, when it initially was introduced into the House, it had nothing about sustainability or environment in it. We were able to make a little bit of a change to that and at least get uh, sustainability and environmental ed included in it. Um, it's not clear yet whether uh, that change will be continued when it goes through the Senate, but that kind of approach, of instead of trying to create a whole new bill, get ourselves into some of the trains that are leaving the station, some of the bigger bills, and uh, get ourselves included, I think is, is part of the way we need to we need to go. I think we also need to try to look at repurposing some of the existing funding. Um, there appears to be some interest in the Department of Ed in uh, directing some work study money, for example, to uh, students who want to work in the community on some of the big community issues. Those funds already exist. There's a lot of money going out of the work study now. Let's try to get a little more focused on the kinds of issues that, that we're concerned about. And finally, the third thing is I think we need to really look at um, uh, changes in policy and, and new programs that aren't going to cost a lot of money. One idea that's been floating around a little bit is to take, um, to adapt uh, uh, the Department of Ed's Blue Ribbon Schools Program, which rewards and, and acknowledges schools that make great progress academically, um, and, and try to create something similar to like, like a Green Ribbon School Program. That would cost a lot of money, um, and uh, I, think, I think could attract some bipartisan support. I also think we have to really look at how we frame things with this administration and, and this Congress. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of their big agenda items is really about moving towards a green economy. I, I would argue that virtually everything that each one of us does in this room contributes to educating for that green, green economy. And uh, that frame of educating for a green economy is a very big tent that um, a lot of us can fit under and work together under. I think that uh, we are in a, a time in the history of this country um, where um, opponents of science are um, on the rise. And um, I live in the state of Virginia, and I have a, an attorney general who came into office last November because um, uh, Virginia's on its own election cycle. Um, and he's intent on spending the, the four years of, of um, his uh, term um, using uh, opposition to science as a means of gaining higher office on his own part. And I think we see that um, uh, in, in a number of other uh, uh, spaces in the, in the political life in the United States. So um, we're, we're coming into what will be, I think, for many of us, a, a much more um, difficult time. I think that in terms of opportunities, though, clearly um, no um, thread with, within this um, uh, fabric of environmental education uh, can, can go it alone. We need to look for ways to make coalitions, and, and I said a few moments ago that um, linking with uh, healthcare is, is one way to do that. So um, I, I, this Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment that I run here in Washington, D.C., is one of 10 pediatric environmental health specialty units. So wherever you are in the country, um, there is a pediatric environmental health specialty unit in your region. EPA divides the region into the country into 10 regions, so there's one for every region. And so this is at least um, a small group of people um, to whom the rest of us in this room uh, can reach out to that uh, think that these topics are important and might form uh, allies uh, for teaching, for research, and for other um, uh, kinds of, of conjoint um, endeavors. And so I would invite you to consider um, looking beyond your, your typical uh, cast of characters uh, that, that you work with and, and reach out to those in um, the medical and public health professions and build alliances there and, and uh, work towards common goals. Uh, I find this a little uh, more of a 
tougher question. Um, in terms of the political scene, I just came out of Vermont, where you could probably fit the entire population in this room, uh, around 600,000 on it. Um, and so it was easy to get a lot of different type of legislation enacted on a state and even a local level because your voice could be heard. Uh, and, and there was a tremendous amount of respect uh, of trying to listen to collective voices, especially a lot of the elder folks that kept talking about crosswalk signage and stuff. They're pretty active. Uh, I, uh, I also think about, we, we discussed a little bit, I think it's called the elephant in the room on economics. That's actually why I was asked to speak here today, uh, is my experience in the field of ecological economics. Uh, looking at current trends with the recession in mind with the economy, uh, it's tremendously on people's mind. If you recall, there was a, a Pew poll at the beginning of 2009 that listed the top 20 priorities, political priorities for the nation. Um, and uh, climate change legislation out of 20 priorities came in 20th. Uh, the top four had to deal with the economy and national security. Number four, interestingly enough, was education. Um, and then I also think about uh, the, the latest uh, Nobel Prize winner for economics for last year's, Lynn Ostrom, um, who won for her work on looking at the value of the commons and commons resource management uh, and, and ecological economics herself. She's done a tremendous amount of work on, on seeing how people can come together around the value of the commons and not exploit it, as has been listed in the theory of the tragedy of the commons, but actually preserve it for, for the welfare and the betterment of all. Um, and then I, I look at uh, the, the students that I'm teaching and, and, um, and, and the community members that are increasingly active and actually are increasingly demanding that we focus more on solutions, which I think is very critical. There's a lot of talk always about problems, and we've essentially been doing it for probably the past 40 years, I'd say, in the environmental movement. This is wrong, that's wrong, things are continuing to be wrong unless you start doing something pretty much like how I'm doing it. Um, and saying that we don't, we, we want to cease moving away from an issue and moving towards issues. So focusing on solutions, where can we, can we go forward with? Uh, and uh, there's a journal uh, that's just been released um, that's edited by uh, Bob Costanza, David Orr, Paul Hawking, John Todd, and a host of other big names. Uh, that's called Solutions. It's a hybrid peer review journal. And um, they have a, a tremendous amount of uh, content involved, uh, also on the online portal, where people can kind of go in and, and put in their own solutions. They're also really looking for submissions. I encourage you all in your work to really get active in it and to make sure that all the solutions that are out there are also known about. All right? We want to make sure that we uh, enjoy our successes as much as possible. I want to uh, hear more from you folks. So let me suggest that <clears throat> earlier in the conversations today and yesterday, there are this occasional discussion about the language of education, the language of science, and differences between those things. And Nadine was asking the question about what are some barriers to um, having a unified effort to secure public funding, increase public funding for environmental education and or for uh, things that are related to environmental education. So I don't want to narrow it to a definition or, or make it too broad. But if you were to think of yourself as Europe, that this room is Europe, <clears throat> there are, and this is Southern Europe down here, so there's Spain and Italy. Languages sound kind of the same. They use a lot of the same words. It gets really confusing when you get to France and Belgium and places like that. And then there's Scandinavia, and God knows what's going on up there. And I would ask you, when you're thinking about the languages that you use to talk about the work that you do, what are some of the languages that you use? And I'm looking here at Brian Day, the head of the North American Association for Environmental Education. And Brian is very expert in a lot of different languages. 
languages. I consider him to be multilingual. Um, but he also has to very specifically speak the language of that field that's known as environmental education. And environmental literacy is the particular focus. But what are some of the other languages here in Washington that are spoken about education? Anybody want to offer up some ideas? Oh, come on, it's not that part. <laughs> education for the 21st century. Education for the 21st century. Um, unpack that a little bit. Skills, and, and if, if you sort of take that to Washington speak, that's called education reform in a lot of cases. That's, that sort of fits in that category. There's a suggestion here. So there's all the policy around accountability, testing, and standards. Right. We need we need to measure things. There's a there's sort of an accountability, performance, measurement. So that's that's one of the languages. This language of accountability. So on one hand, and actually that's that's a major debate right now. In the, Congress is the debate between accountability and education reform. Are there other thoughts about language? Or? It could be a cultural language that we haven't actually discussed yet. Different demographics speak the word environmentally differently. So what the comment here is that um, in, a, in a world of different cultures, where I live in Fairfax County, there are 130 different languages spoken in the public school system. And so here we have all of these different definitions, all of these different ways of what does the word environment mean, et cetera. So that's, a, that's another layer of language. Practice, we have informal education, formal education. Really good point. Informal education, formal education, what's the difference classroom education versus nature centers or museums or whatever? And there's different perspectives here. Innovation and entrepreneurship. Say again, please. Innovation and entrepreneurship. Innovation, um, the, the whole idea of you know, preparation for um, future life, or whatever those might be. The, the main thing being here that if you think of yourselves as an, a, a group of people who have common goals, um, we all speak different languages, but we're not necessarily multilingual. And I think to be effective, one of the blocks to um, stepping forward on policy is that we all have to learn to be a little more multilingual. We need to look at the winds that are blowing in Washington, D.C. A congressman who thinks about environmental education thinks of it as a very precious, not very important kind of thing. But they're thinking about green jobs. They're thinking about deeper education, education reform problem solving. They're thinking about these, these uh, issues and we have to learn to do those translations so that we uh, are able to go into different arenas with our own language and translate that language to the, to the frame of reference and, and that this, this language question of how do we talk education reform, how do we talk environmental education, how do we talk science literacy, science, technology, engineering, and math, how do we speak these different languages at different times it's one of the real challenges that we all face. And I just raise that as one of the, what I consider to be one of the major impediments to our actually being effective on, on Capitol Hill and being effective in state legislators and elsewhere because we just we haven't learned to be multilingual. That's, that's a nice segue to sort of the, the second question I wanted to pose. And maybe we can also expand on what, what I'd like to hear more about is that you know environmental literacy should be a bipartisan issue. There shouldn't be these camps of, of clearly the Republicans are are going to be against that, and the Tea Party movement is, is bad news for that. Um, but how can we make it clear, just that science is clearly a bipartisan issue, um, that it is? And also, how can we, expanding a bit on what Jerome touched on, how can we basically make our, our constituency larger um, so that there are more and more uh, of us out there making the point how important this is to society at large? Sure. Um, on this last question of bipartisanship, um, what's interesting to me is that uh, feedback I've gotten from, from uh, the Republican side when we talk about environmental ed is, is a sense that um, we're not connecting it to economic issues and, and economic literacy and economic learning. 
uh, in the way that we should. And I think that's a valid criticism. Um, I'm not always sure my economics are the same as their economics, but uh, nonetheless, the, the need for our field to uh, bring economics into the um, into our curriculum, into our classrooms, as part of the environmental curriculum, I think is really important. So strengthening our strengthening our own work in that arena, I think, will help us make the case that, it, that it's a bipartisan issue. I think, relatedly, um, business is increasingly coming to recognize that as they try to become more sustainable and, and change their relationship to the environment, that they've got a workforce problem, that the CEO can make a policy around this, but that doesn't mean that the line staff and the management are going to understand what they're talking about. So what, what we also need to do, I think, is really bring business into the advocacy effort for sustainability and environmental education in a way that it hasn't been done so far. And in this regard, um, I really want to just point out uh, the National Environmental Education Foundation's work with business. They're one of the few groups that really have started to make some inroads in, in working in that direction. Um, in terms of the political wins that Kevin was talking about, uh, what nobody mentioned, which was interesting to me, is the STEM education uh, movement. And to, 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 for a little context from my perspective, um, we're still a fringe subject. Uh, Kevin calls us a fourth tier subject. Um, and, and I think we have to acknowledge that and recognize that we just don't have a lot of power in and of, our, in and of ourselves. So what are some of the big trains that are leaving the station? The, the STEM education movement has done some terrific work in terms of getting Congress's attention. There are some major reports that have just come out. And um, we are failing to convince them that we are part of what they need to be pushing. Uh, and that we can actually help them. From my perspective, one of the STEM education movement's uh, weaknesses is they, they haven't really addressed the question of STEM education for what? And I think we've got the answer for that. Um, Kathy alluded to it in a way uh, a second ago when she was talking about 21st century skills. Um, to me, STEM education needs to be about uh, mobilizing for a sustainable future and really starting to shape, uh, prepare students for some of the challenges of the 21st century, not just learning for learning's sake. Some STEM engineers may not agree with me on that, but I think we've got a case there to make. Um, and finally, I think, I think we need to stop competing with ourselves, particularly in the K through 12 arena, and acknowledge the reality that it's, it's a nine, the school day goes from you know, eight o'clock to three o'clock, or whatever it happens to be in your community, it's a fixed pie. And right now, by my count, we've got uh, at least 10 different uh, communities jostling and elbowing for a piece of that school day. So we've got climate education, we've got energy education, we've got ocean education, we've got sustainability education, environmental education, ecological education, conservation education, so on and so forth. And I'm sure you can add to that list. We haven't acknowledged that not, that we can't all get in there. Um, and so the extent to which one of us is winning, the rest of us are losing. And so how do we deal with that? Uh, it's less an issue at the higher ed level, but certainly in the K through 12 levels. I, I think something we, we really have to stay out of here and not deal with. There are um, a lot of things uh, that I am, but one of the things I am clearly not is a business, per a business person. Um, however, uh, as I try and do my uh, work in terms of environmental health, one of the understandings that I'm getting from the business community is that they need um, predictability in order to plan for what they're going to do over time. And I think that in, in the work that we're trying to do in environmental issues writ large, um, we do need to do a better job of reaching out and bringing the business community in because as climate change goes on, as other environmental changes that we know and understand at a scientific level occur, 
that is only going to decrease predictability and increase chaos in the scientific meaning of that term. Um, and we need to help the business people figure out how to make the plans that they're going to need to make to be successful going forward. And for those of us who are academic institutions, that may mean, for example, going over to the business school and sitting down and talking with the faculty in the business school about, you know, how do we partner in this endeavor to get the next generation of business leaders um, the kind of understanding that they're going to need to be able to function um, in this world and to be able to become advocates um, for increased education, for um, climate change mitigation and adaptation, for species preservation, and things along those lines. I could just add to that. I think that that would be tremendous if we could find several industry leaders to really become champions for this, you know, our effort, because it's been quite effective in the physical sciences community where they, they've linked up with all kinds of big businesses. We now they go together lobbying up on Capitol Hill, and that opens up all kinds of doors. So it would be tremendous <laughs> if this, this group could accomplish that. Samir or Kevin, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, um, I'd like to echo the aspect of linking up with business. I was actually hired in my position by the mining industry. And um, the, the larger mining organizations that recognize uh, that having an ecologist on board that's linking up and, and thinking systemically is valuable. And uh, I think that there's a lot of other opportunities for that. Uh, I wanted to speak a little bit about the, uh, the part of the question around extending constituencies. And I think that a lot of times the, the conversations that we're having, we're trying to get people to, to come to our agenda, right? To adopt our agenda and to say, we need to push this forward, uh, rather than going in and meeting people at their level, at their needs, uh, similar to uh, Orson Aguilar's words. And one of the things that I know that's completely debilitating uh, a lot of uh, young professionals, emerging leaders, is in the educational realm, student debt. I think it's, 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 it's incredible of how much we've gone from, uh, basically our, our educational institutions uh, requiring so much money that uh, students go out and they can't do the jobs that they want to. You know, they can't say that, yes, I'm gonna go into the environmental field because the environmental field does not offer any money and there's limited jobs. Uh, and they're all in a lot of climates that I don't like, you know. <laughs> pretty much, you know, going out in, uh, you know, a northern hardwood forest, well, that's not my bag. Uh, but that's where we're trying to push everyone into. So trying to say, well, you know, where do we need to talk? Where are the different lines, the communication aspects uh, and instead of talking at people, talking and learning with people. I think it's a big way. If you're talking about constituents, that's the number one deal. And I will pass it back to the podium. Okay. Well, I think at this point, I'd like to open it up to audience questions, and I'll save my last question for the end. So, um, are the mics around? Uh, why don't we start? I'll save you later. Um, back there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Hi, my name is Beth Short, and I uh, work for an environmental education program called Nature's Classroom. Uh, thank you. And I'm also a graduate student with Lesley University's Ecological Teaching and Learning Program. Um, and it is a program that is informed uh, through an integral teaching model. And one of the things that I think about and would like to offer to the panel, you know, you mentioned that there are all of these different, you know, teaching models or, or pedagogies where and you have climate education, you know, and that they're competing for each other. And I, I want to consider looking at that through you know, a really integrated lens. Where can we find the places where all of these different ideas intersect and come together and move forward? And how do we do that? What kind of a process can we create for that, I guess, is the question for the panel. Thanks. I'll take a stab at that. <clears throat> This is not the most popular idea for 
doing that, but there's a lot of discussion around this in education circles, which is that when using the education reform language and using the future skills discussion, when people talk about how uh, literate our students are going to be in the future, uh, they often talk about there's not enough good science education and the kids aren't connecting with science education and kids are opting out of science education. So one of the discussions that's taking place at the uh, sort of departmental, state, state of Department of Education level um, is whether there should be a fourth science in high school. And, you know, we have <clears throat> life science and biology and physics and chemistry, and the question is whether there should be a fourth, and that would be earth science. And there are people who are suggesting that one of the ways to bring um, environmental education slash all the big, you know, sustainability education, all these various other types of education, but actually to bring real rigor in earth science back to schools and to make those comprehensive courses that are geared very much toward the um, sort of skills for the 21st century <clears throat> that look at climate, that look at you know, life science in, a, in an ecological sense, that would look at um, certainly the, the whole um, well, the spheres, of, you know, and you use those spheres as a way to teach, and not just use the paradigm of science education, putting information in someone's head, but use the paradigms of environmental education and uh, service learning and some of these other things where you're actually developing skill sets around it. So a real kind of revamping of what earth science means. And, you know, that's, that's one of the discussions that's take, that is taking place. And it's not necessarily popular with everyone. Something that is in that arena. I, I was impressed, um, and I'm going to maybe do something a little unfair, but I, I was impressed by our previous panelist who talked about her experience as a fifth grade teacher and, and having at that level too, in fact, integrated all. And so my question is how do fifth grade teachers do that? I know you speak for all fifth grade teachers in the world, but. Yeah, that's me. I, I can pretend to. You know, I, I can always speak for myself. You can do it. Um, and I taught fifth grade long before there were state standards to have to go through. So this is back in the day, 15 years ago. But really, how I did it was here's an example we were learning Colorado geography. So you study Colorado rivers, but you also have to connect the Colorado rivers by use, by flow patterns with the watersheds of the West. You read stories about how you write about it. You calculate how many miles of river there are. You know, you can map. You really, you have to stretch. You know, it's not, math is the hard one. But, well, it's really nice to calculate how many miles of river, but it's trickier to you know, I get that to fit in. I think now there's there's so much more curriculum out there now. I don't think that there's a dearth of curriculum for environmental based integration, for, for integrating that. I think there's just a dearth of people using it. You know, Facing the Future puts out really great stuff that I steal from every day now. You know, because they already have done the work for me. I don't have to do it as much. But yeah, it's, but, a, but a, you know, kids have a more integrated viewpoint. In fifth grade, because it hasn't been taken away from them. That you don't you use math here, and you use science here, and oh, you might want to learn to write. It's a nice idea. You know, so. Well, thank you, and I, I apologize again for <coughs> you on, on uh, show there. Um, and I think for those of us who have specialized in, and tend to teach in specialized kinds of ways, um, part of the take home message there is. Um, trying to do more team teaching. Um, I know in terms of what I teach um, in the School of Public Health and the School of Medicine, I don't have the expertise to teach all of the stuff that I need to do, so I bring people from elsewhere into my classroom to help me with that teaching and um, get some integration um, for my students and some broadening of horizons for my students in that kind of way. Yeah. I can say where you're from. Um, I'm Lynn Sherry, and 
the producer of the young books on climate change films and author and illustrator. Now I'm at the University of Colorado. This uh, follows up really nicely with what she was saying because um, we have a project where we're bringing the films to all these schools in Colorado and we're actually having climate scientists. I'm at the uh, University of Colorado in STAR, as a visiting scholar this year. And so we have the scientists going to the classroom talking about how climate affects their local ecosystem. So you have the melting of the uh, snow melt, and you can actually look at the flow of the Colorado River. This is a long-term environmental research um, study that's funded by, um, by NSF. But uh, my question is about um, connecting the environment with the economy. Because if, as you saw in Dreaming in Green, you know, these girls saved $53,000 uh, from their electric bill. And so if we're going to get these films all throughout Colorado and then have a contest, and I'll talk to Governor Ritter about this, um, to see how much other schools throughout Colorado can see. So I wanted to ask the panelists what other examples you might have of, com of combining win-win, you know, where young people are doing things that we're learning about climate change, the science, the uh, economics of it, they're saving money, can spill over into the community. Um, in, in the case of Dreaming Green, this, uh, one of the girl's fathers traded out all his air conditioners for Energy Star once he saw what his daughter had done. And this went to the health issue. They also, these kids uh, had a project where they stopped school bus idling, and the health costs just went down because of asthma. So what other examples do you know where there's win-win between environment and the economy? After all, Americans worship money. Yeah. Um, in terms of, uh, I can speak on the business sector, not not so much in terms of educational programs, though, but there's lots of really famous examples. Uh, Ray Anderson with Interface Carpeting is probably the biggest, um, you know, of essentially turning around an, an entire global enterprise uh, through carpet manufacturing and, and really um, streamlining it towards. Um, uh, green design, uh, and then along with that respect, uh, in your home state, there's Rock Mountain Institute, um, Amory Lovins, uh, and folks leading that, there's Natural Capitalism Institute, which is Hunter Lovins, leading that guild, um, and I, I think that there's there's enough case studies out there, it's, it's tremendous of things that have been done in terms of new designs. Uh, uh, Bill McDonough, who's an architect and a designer, and, uh, heading up this whole cradle to cradle certification around designing new products. So it's, it's really going after um, the, the consumption aspect of, well, we're not just necessarily downcycling, which is the process that we do right now. We, we don't recycle 100% of these products, we downcycle them. So how can we redesign products so we can use 100% of everything in here that's true recycling? I just wanted to clarify. I was actually, I wanted to see if um, you know of, of any examples of in school, you know, of actually tying those kinds of things to education.
And the uh, National Wildlife Federation um, has one of the NECO schools, USA. Uh, the uh, American Forest Foundation has the uh, PLT Green Schools. They're uh, you know, statewide. Maryland has a Green Schools program. And a lot of those do try to make that connection between the facility and you know, better management of the facility or greening the grounds with the curriculum and sort of tying those things together. And a lot of that does have economic implications. You know, there have been a number of studies of schools. Uh, so a lot of the schools that we have in the country are pretty old. They're not very energy efficient. Uh, there's some indications that the medium-sized school will save up to $100,000 a year with an energy management program. And getting the kids involved in that, getting them involved in recycling, those kind of things, and, and giving that an educational outcome. So a lot of the green school programs are really focused on that. And sadly, there are not yet enough green schools, but um, I think it's moving in that direction. They're increasing you know, by 100 a month. Yeah, let's take a question over here. Hi, I am uh, Mike Town. I uh, teach uh, AP Environmental Science and Environmental Design in um, Redmond, Washington. And this year I'm uh, an Einstein Fellow with the National Science Board for the National Science Foundation. And I wanted to give a quick shout out to Earth Day Network um, because um, they help teachers all across the United States get uh, kind of aware of some of these policy issues. My question will be for Jim in a second here, but I wanted to dovetail something that Mark said. Yes, there, there, there does need to be a, um, you know, a fourth science class. And, and I would say that right now, AP Environmental Science actually fulfills that niche. As a case in point, this year we had 85,000 students across the United States take the AP Environmental Science test. It grows at a rate of about 17% per year, which means in four years, we have 150,000 students taking the test more than AP Physics. So, you know, we do have those numbers. And there's kids who are taking those classes who aren't taking the test. I'm doing a lot of research right now on STEM um, education issues. I'm reading all the reports, and there's a lot of recommendations about increasing AP enrollment as a method of increasing STEM in education, especially in the sciences. My question for Jim, from a policy standpoint, the members that you talk to and the broader coalitions of folks that are out there, are they aware of the potential that reaching, you know, in, in policy arenas and in, in the way ESEA gets reauthorized, that AP environmental science is a way that we can kind of backdoor environmental literacy through, you know, the curriculum from, from K-12? I, I, don't, I don't know that I can speak for well, them. They probably aren't. But there are a couple of issues, though, that um, I want to just mention. One is that um, as I recently learned, uh, it, a lot of schools will not, a lot of colleges and universities will not accept uh, environmental science as a fulfillment of an admission requirement, of their science admission requirement, because it's not considered a lab course. And so uh, I think, I think we, we've got to address that issue in the process. Um, we can push environmental AP course, environmental science AP courses, but we also need the demand to increase, and that demand is being artificially tampered, uh, uh, dampened by the fact that a lot of kids just simply can't use it to get into college. So that's that's a policy issue. Um, and I think the other issue is that uh, even at, with our most ambitious um, numbers for kids taking environmental science, it's still a small, small, small percentage of the overall student body. And so we've also got to look at policy issues for policy changes that will um, bring environment into existing courses uh, so that there's a, a literacy that's taking place that goes beyond just the specialized, the, the students that are able to take those specialized courses. Jeff, you got something to add? I do. Um, you raise a really good question. And if I were to try to fit it in a context, I'd say that right now today, in the US Congress, there are very important pieces of legislation that might contribute to that, one of which is uh, the environmental literacy and so-called BWEC programs at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. There's just been the reintroduction and reauthorization of the National Environmental Education Act. 
But I want to draw your attention, everyone's attention, to a particularly important bill to this subject, and that's um, a piece of legislation that's called the No Child Left Inside legislation. And it, it has, it in some ways, an unfortunate name in that it, it gives the impression that it's, it's mostly about getting kids outdoor. When in fact what it is is um, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, some leaders in Maryland, um, a number of folks, uh, Gary Heath, who's here, um, have, have really tried to think through how do you get states to the State Departments of Education, not the State Environmental Departments, but the State Departments of Education, to undertake uh, state environmental literacy plans and to implement those plans through the state education system. And there's a lot of enthusiasm. Some of you are probably involved with some of the state coalitions. There are 30 or 40 of these state coalitions out there now that are working actually on developing these plans in anticipation that this legislation will pass. And one of the key things about the legislation is that it, it's set up to be an amendment to the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which many of you know is also called, or has an unfortunate name called No Child Left Behind. And so it, it moves the discussion of environmental education, environmental literacy, toward the mainstream of education. And uh, because I know he has a great booming voice, I'm going to ask Gary Heath to, to say a couple words about that legislation. They, uh, thank you, Kevin. It is, uh, uh, we have a, a cold, national coalition, over 2,000 organizations representing about 55 million people who are all behind the separate to included the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, uh, incentives by way of money to support states who have a plan, and uh, there's very a lot of freedom to that plan. And if you've worked, uh, as I did at the State Education Agency, you're used to writing these plans. Um, the, we've been looking for $100 million. Currently, we have about 120 members on the House side, about 20 on the Senate side, bipartisan. Over 20 governors have encouraged support. Four states, at least four, have already finished plans. The most recent, I think you had mentioned there was a paper last night, North Carolina, along with Oregon, Maryland, uh, Nebraska. Some states, Maryland, have already started implementing there. We have, as a result of our plan, now have a high school graduation requirement uh, uh, that kids have to have uh, uh, a content area in, in environmental uh, literacy. Uh, so it is a, a big movement. Uh, we don't know, you know, when that legislation will be reauthorized, uh, but we are uh, continuing to work with the administration and the Department of Education. Uh, as, as Kevin mentioned, the Secretary Duncan has become very supportive of this uh, area. And uh, uh, if there's any, uh, we have a big website, anything I could answer uh, by way of helping you, uh, I'd appreciate it. But fundamentally, remember, there are 55 million children in public schools. Their attitudes uh, are developed at a very young age um, and trying to change those attitudes, change some of those uh, knowledge sets as kids grow older becomes more difficult. So uh, systematically asking states uh, to uh, figure out how they're going to do this is a key thing as we look forward. And remember, uh, as our, our teacher from Colorado mentions, uh, when I started in public schools, I was free to do whatever I want. Um, now, education policy fundamentally comes to the elementary and secondary education act. States respond to that, school districts respond to that, teachers end up responding to that. So we have to work, whether it's a, a, the best thing in the world uh, is, is, is arguable, but we have to work within that construct of the elementary and secondary education act. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. So we are about out of time. So I'd like to wrap this panel up by asking each of our panelists to maybe leave us with a final thought about where do you think we ought to go from here? <laughs> final thought. Short. I'll, I'll start. Yeah. Just, just to throw us out of seat. Um, here's a couple things. One is uh, Gary mentioned the uh, No Child Left Inside Coalition. And I'd suggest you just make a note of that. No Child Left Inside Coalition. Um, go to their website. If, you're, if your organization is not signed up to support it, you should. You know, that would be an immediate thing to do. The second is that uh, Jim Elder, uh, my colleague, uh, 
um, that the uh, Campaign for Environmental Literacy really keeps tabs on this legislation, sort of keeps a, a good track on it. And um, so if you go to the Campaign for Environmental Literacy uh, website, sometimes it's called Fund EE, um, that's, the, uh, that's a good place if you want a website that sort of keeps track of all the different uh, pieces of legislation. And then um, my colleague, uh, Patrick Fitzgerald, uh, who's here from uh, the National Wildlife Federation, you might want to raise your hand. Um, Patrick, uh, every couple weeks or so, uh, or every month, uh, puts out a newsletter which gives a status of the various pieces of legislation that are being considered. And uh, what we could do is just basically send you an email saying, you know, would you like to sign up for this, for this uh, newsletter? And you can hear from Patrick every now and again about where things stand. And it'll also, uh, if you can stand it, will subject you to frequent requests from either the No Child Left Inside Coalition, the National Wildlife Federation, or the Campaign for Environmental Literacy, or Earth Day Network, to uh, sign on uh, or support uh, legislation, to uh, consider uh, writing a letter to Congress, or, to write, or sending an email to Congress, there's a variety of different opportunities, which you can say yes or no to, but if you're aware of them, it might make it easier for you to participate in some of these things. So here, last slide. Uh, sure. I guess I'll start talking some more about the economics of this. That's what I'm supposed to be speaking about. Um, uh, I think it's, it's really telling, going back to that Pew survey, of the interests and, and just the mindset that's on the nation around the economy. So really understanding that even throughout the recession, that our GDP, GNP per capita still grew. Right, and, and uh, understanding that that's essentially how we measure our welfare is through that index, through GDP, which still grows with more locks on prisons, with more oil spills, and even through recessions. So in terms of looking at policy of how we can start pushing more around uh, you know, a green economy, uh, looking at connecting with folks through the green jobs movement, which has gotten a lot of play, really because it's it's trying to connect two interests that are geared towards populations that are not being served so much and cultures that are not being served so much. So if, if we can figure out how to make that more of the centerpiece uh, of a lot of our work, 